Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on the topic Migrate to the latest WSO2 micro integrator to unlock all new features. We choose this topic with the reason we need to educate our customers, our partners, and all the community on what to get Migrate into the latest MI. We know some people <coughs> are using uh, some old versions, some are planning to migrate, etc. So as we have released a new MI micro integrator version 1.0, along with the new studio version lately. So we think it is a timely subject to talk about. Let me introduce uh, myself. Uh, I'm Hasita Hiranya. Uh, I'm working as a tech lead at WSO2. Uh, with me today, Srivatsan is joining on this webinar, who is working as a senior software engineer. Okay, so first uh, let's look at today's agenda. So uh, we will start with a brief introduction uh, what WSO2 micro integrator is, and then uh, we will go on talking about the runtime improvements we have made through the new latest release. And uh, then we will talk about the integration studio, our artifact development tool. Uh, what we have brought uh, in uh, newly uh, that you can use. And then after that, uh, we will uh, have a discussion about the deployment options uh, coming with the WSO2 EI. Uh, and then uh, we will go and talk about the server management facilities we provide uh, to look at the artifacts uh, that are being deployed onto the micro-integrator runtime. And then uh, we will briefly describe our observability story, uh, like uh, how you can get statistics out of the WSO2 MI runtime, and how you can uh, view them, how you can uh, extract logs and analyze them uh, likewise. And then I want to uh, specifically talk about the WSO2 EI connect connectors, which are uh, extensions to WSO2 MI runtime. Uh, as we have done a couple of improvements uh, on that uh, connector experience as well. Okay, uh, to start with, uh, so uh, about the uh, a word about the uh, WSO2 micro integrator. We have uh, released the latest micro integration uh, version 1.2.0. It is actually falling under WSO2 EI7 umbrella. So, uh, actually, WSO2 Enterprise Integrator has uh, two components namely, micro integrator and the streaming integrator. Micro integrator handles all integrations like uh, file integrations, uh, integrations related to data, uh, so a, uh, all the integrations capabilities except for uh, event history integration is handled by the micro integrator uh, component. We have a specialized component for streaming uh, integration, which is actually a separate area. Um, so uh, in fact, WSO2 EI is a composite of WSO2 micro integrator and the streaming integrator. So in this webinar, we will specifically talk about the micro integrator component. Let us uh, uh, introduce what are the new runtime improvements we are bringing with the new release. Uh, and uh, for that, I would like to call upon my uh, colleague Srivatsan. Srivatsan. Thank you, Hasita. Uh, one of the major improvements that we have done to the latest micro integrator runtime is bringing support for clustering and coordination. If we take a look at our previous micro integrator versions, they did not have the concept of clustering or even coordination. So they, we were unable to use them in VM deployments because if we deploy two tasks in two nodes, they would be performing duplicated work. Uh, we saw this as a major drawback in VM deployments since we cannot increase the number of nodes 
to scale of the deployments and then expect them to work in a coordinated manner. Uh, in micro integrator 120, we have introduced a RDBMS based coordination mechanism so that the nodes can communicate with each other via a database. So the coordination uh, works with the lead election mechanism where a node in the cluster is elected as the master and it coordinates. And another improvement we have done to the runtime is adding the support for hot deployment. Uh, we brought back the support for hot deployment because the developers had to keep restarting the server for every single change they do for an artifact. Uh, it's not about a whole composite application. Maybe a single word in a single artifact, having to restart the server for that reason is too much because the time it takes to deploy the particular composite application on top of the other non-related artifacts will, will add up to the server startup time. So we have enabled the hot deployment by default for micro integrator to make the developers lives easier. But uh, if you take a look at our Docker image, we have disabled the hot deployment by default because this disturbs the nature of immutability in containers. Uh, let's take a look at what are the optimizations that we have done to support container deployments. So we have introduced a readiness probe. This readiness probe is a vital config in K8 because this is what tells the container management system whether the server is ready to receive requests or not. In our previous micro integrator versions, the users had to use their own API, but now we have an inbuilt healthy API. The API will indicate whether the server has started and all the CFs are deployed successfully. The users can simply send a GET request to the healthy API and invoke it in their environment. Uh, as part of the container improvements, Another improvement is we have introduced this injecting parameters. So now you have the flexibility of maintaining or updating the configurations in each environment without creating an artifacts or configurations for separate environments. Uh, basically, you can create a single Docker image and use them in multiple environments. As shown in this example, we can define environment variables or system properties in our server configuration as well as synapse configurations. Once we define the environment variables or a system variable, we can populate during runtime. So basically we can have the single artifact and single Docker image across multiple environments, which makes developers lives easier. Uh, and also, uh, we have introduced a concept of static and dynamic secrets to secure sensitive data in both the server level configurations or in our snaps configurations. Uh, as in our first column, we call the sensitive data that we specify directly in configuration files as static secrets, where we encrypt the plain text and use the LAS in our configuration file. And then what we do is we burn that file in the docker image and use it in our environment so if you take a look at the dynamic secrets what we do is we encrypt the secret and we expose them as an environment variable or a system property so what happens here is we start the server or during server startup or running mediation we can resolve the environment variables and system properties so we refer to them as dynamic secrets Uh, as part of managing secrets, we have introduced support for Docker and Kubernetes secrets. And then we have revamped the WSO2 Secure Vault experience. As shown in this example, in the WSO2 Vault lookup function, now the users can specify Docker secrets, Kubernetes secrets, or even a file. They can define their secrets in a file and refer to them in their Synapse configurations. And if you take a look at the secure vault experience, if the number of characters that we use in the password is too lengthy, there is some limitations from the WSO2 secure vault. To overcome that limitation, we have added support for HashiCorp secrets as well. That support is available as a WAM update. So if we 
take a look at that support we have added two authentication methods one is static token authentication and upload pool authentication in hashicorp secrets support uh, uh, let's take a look at what are the improvements we have done as part of the user management side so in our previous micro integrator we had support for external user stores but we had only read support now we have read and write support for LDAP and RDBMS external user stores. Once we configure either one of these external user stores, the admin user who has the correct admin privileges can view and add or even delete the users. Uh, this functionality is basic at the moment because the uh, person who person can't manage their roles and this user management can be achieved via the micro integrator command line interface or the integrator dashboard. Another addition to the micro integrator runtime is the JSON transform mediator. Using JSON transform mediator, the users can apply XML to JSON transformation properties to individual artifacts. In our previous versions, we had synapse properties file where we defined, for example, JSON auto primitive property to false that will be applied globally across all our artifacts. But if we want to change that to only a particular artifact during a mediation flow, we can use the XM, uh, JSON transform mediator and define the property. And also we can write JSON schema and store it in our registry and refer it during mediation using the JSON transform mediator by referring the schema from the registry. That way, when we are transforming messages to JSON, we can manipulate the JSON payload according to the schema. Uh, another addition is the transaction counter that we have in my micro integrator 120. Basically, a transaction is a request that is coming into the micro integrator. Any inbound request that comes to REST API or proxy service or inbound endpoint is considered as one transaction. This transaction counter is uh, responsible for counting request uh, received via uh, HTTP pass through and JMS transport. Uh, however, we need to note one thing in asynchronous messaging scenarios uh, where we have listening and sending requests, the, the requests are considered as a single transaction. Uh, this uh, transaction counts are persisted in a database and we can use the micro integrator command line interface to retrieve the count or even get a report by a monthly or a period basis. Uh, as uh, other improvements, we have revamped the entire RabbitMQ transport to support smoothly and with stable inter interaction with the RabbitMQ. Uh, and we have added dynamic log4j configuration so that users can change the log levels without need to restart the server. And we have added support for uh, SMP 3.0 for file sharing and now we can generate swagger de generation, swagger definition for the data services. Uh, these are uh, some of the improvements we have done uh, for 120 release. You can check out our release tag in GitHub to see the complete list of improvements. Uh, now let me hand over the presentation to Hasita, who will be taking you through the enhancements that we have done to our integration studio over to US. Yeah, uh, so we have lately released uh, Integration Studio 7.2.0 version. So that is uh, the development tool uh, we use to develop the artifacts for micro integrator runtime. So uh, let's see what is new in there. Um, it is uh, uh, faster and lightweight. Uh, this is the most important thing uh, because we know any tool is easy to use when it works fast and uh, it is not bulky. We all know that. Uh, so uh, uh, WSO2 
uh, integration in studio, the new version is faster, they, mainly because uh, it is built on Eclipse uh, platform 2020.06. And uh, uh, you know, uh, Eclipse uh, new version is more compatible with uh, uh, most popular OS versions like uh, Big, uh, Mac OS Big Sur, Ubuntu 2020, and Windows 10. And uh, it automatically gains that uh, performance improvements and enhancements uh, because it is built on top of uh, a later version of Eclipse. Another thing we have added is uh, we, we, we have included samples on popular EIP patterns. So you can, uh, uh, this is a good start if you are learning WSO2 EI or uh, when you are starting the journey with uh, WSO2 EI. So uh, you can simply uh, uh, click on some sample and it will uh, automatically generate the project structure and all. And then uh, you can explore it, uh, you can change it uh, to suit your scenario. So it is. Uh, it can be seen as a starting point to build your scenario as well. Uh, if, if that scenario is uh, built around some uh, basic EIP pattern. And uh, we have also modified the canvas settings. Uh, so now integration logic development is made uh, easy with the design view. Uh, you don't need to uh, go to uh, like XML uh, configs or you don't need to know any coding. Uh, so mediation palette is brought to the left side. That is one of the main changes. Uh, so you can drag and drop and easily make the changes. And also uh, we have uh, added the ability to uh, added some description to each and every mediator so that when you look at the uh, uh, mediation element, uh, you can mention something that is uh, with regard to your scenario, what that uh, mediation part does, what that mediator does. Uh, that, uh, that feasibility is there. And also, uh, when it comes to API design, we, we have revamped that uh, design to be more understandable. Uh, you have used the previous versions of our integration studio. Uh, uh, so we, we, we were lacking uh, the concept of uh, APIs and resources because API can have uh, more than one resource and uh, the de uh, design uh, was uh, not very intensive. And uh, with the new version, uh, that uh, uh, separation is clearly there. Uh, what are the resources and what is the uh, parent API? And also we have added the cycle generations uh, and all the capabilities uh, uh, that we were lacking uh, in terms of API. Uh, you can uh, import a cycle and build an API. Also, you can build the API and generate the cycle. Okay, so after you have developed the integration, you need a way to test it for correctness. Uh, that's a very important thing uh, in software development. Uh, uh, no difference to the integration logic development as well. So we have introduced a new uh, unit testing framework so that you, get, uh, so that, uh, you can write after you have written your integration logic, you can uh, write test cases around it or, or uh, test cases around the APIs, uh, proxy services, and the sequences. This is actually a convenient way to have a, a very complex uh, integration, very big integration use case. Uh, if you have divided your use case to small, small parts called sequences, uh, in a logical manner, you can individually test that uh, sequences for the correctness, so, the, uh, so that uh, it will be more easy for you to write test cases and uh, uh, maintain the integrity of um, different parts of that uh, big integration scenario. So, um, 
we i have uh, mentioned the documentation link uh, here as well and also uh, it enables you to mock uh, any uh, endpoints uh, that wso 2 ei supports so that you can uh, uh, test your endpoints okay so uh, we have added the ability to generate docker images um, after you have written uh, your logic, uh, you will uh, be end up with uh, uh, CFs. We call it uh, carbon applications. Uh, you can uh, generate Docker images uh, out of those uh, car applications. Basically, we have included WSO2 micro integrator runtime into the uh, integration studio. And what you can do is uh, you can create uh, images based uh, keeping that base image embedded to WSO2 in my runtime uh, and including um, your logic elements into that. Basically, uh, you can pick and choose the car files you want to include in that image and uh, build that image. Uh, additionally, you can uh, push the image to a uh, Docker repository as well uh, if you are given credentials. You can push them as well within the integration studio set. And uh, when it comes to uh, Docker, the most famous uh, container orchestration platform is basically Kubernetes. We have added some additional functionalities uh, so that you can deploy uh, easily on Kubernetes. Uh, basically, uh, you can create a Kubernetes exporter project and uh, you have all the facilities uh, we provide with Docker exporter project plus. Uh, you can generate uh, artifacts for Kubernetes deployment. Basically what we have done is uh, we have built uh, or released uh, uh, a Kubernetes uh, operator we call it WSO2 EI Kubernetes operator. And uh, using the integration studio, you can generate the artifacts, uh, .cr files, we call them, uh, so that uh, you can uh, deploy them uh, using um, WSO2 EI Kubernetes operator. And uh, integration studio is more integrated than before basically um, so we uh, we have done a lot of things to make sure that you don't step out of the my uh, integration studio to get the things done uh, for an example um, when you want to uh, integrate or develop with the connector previously you, you wanted to go to the connector store download the connect and import it to the integration studio app to use that but now you can go and browse uh, the connector store from within integration studio itself right so you don't need to go anywhere so uh, you can browse them uh, and download the required uh, connect and all the operations uh, will be listed on the panel and it is very straightforward to use and also uh, we have embedded WSO2 MI runtime uh, into the integration studio. So, uh, for testing purposes, you don't go to uh, want to go to anywhere. Uh, you can just uh, deploy the car CF onto the embedded runtime and test it then and there. And uh, you don't necessarily to uh, use tools like Postman to test the scenarios. Uh, all the testing tools are also included into the microcontroller there so so, uh, so uh, integration is made easy and uh, uh, the more features like this will come in the future in the future versions as well okay so uh, now uh, we have looked into the ways of developing the integration logic and now we know what are the new things we have in the integration micro integrator runtime. Then uh, now we'll uh, have a look at uh, like the, what are the deployment options it has, like how we can deploy it at the end of the day. 
So basically, uh, WSO2 microintegrator can be deployed on top of virtual machines, VMs, uh, and as well as Docker containers. When uh, it comes to uh, containers, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Kubernetes is the famous container orchestrator. Uh, we are shipping uh, a Kubernetes EI operator for integrated development uh, deployment as well. So uh, we are uh, basically supporting both worlds, right? So we were supporting uh, deployment on VMs along with ESP and EI versions. We will continue to do that with the micro-integrator as well. Additionally, uh, you can deploy on top of containers as well. So we are, uh, so uh, WSO2 MI can be deployed on, uh, in, in, in both aspects, basically. So if you take uh, any uh, software, uh, uh, if you have a closer look at the development stage, the stages of a typical software, uh, you have uh, five common stages, namely design, develop, test, and then uh, debug, and if, uh, uh, if there's issues, you fix them, and finally, uh, you deploy. So WSO2 Integration Studio uh, offers all these capability in a single unit. Uh, so, uh, so you can uh, design, you can develop, you can test uh, using the integration studio itself, and uh, it has all the debugging capabilities in the mediation level as well. Uh, and it has all the consoles, uh, uh, console that you can uh, see the logs when you are running your integration in, in MI. And finally, you can push the deployment uh, onto VM or Kubernetes using Studio as well. Uh, so, uh, if you look at that, uh, a, a typical uh, connected developer experience, we can identify three main stages, uh, develop, test, and deploy. Uh, we use uh, uh, WSO2 uh, Integration Studio to develop the artifacts, and uh, we can use the testing framework to test our artifacts and uh, you can also uh, mock your services and finally uh, you can uh, deploy uh, uh, using uh, cf deployment plugin so all these uh, it's nine o'clock all these uh, so all these uh, uh, deployment options are provided by the integration studio. So uh, basically, they are Maven projects. Um, the deploy plugin is actually a Maven plugin. Uh, when you do the project, it will uh, create a CF and uh, you can optionally point a location so that it will uh, push your CF to that location. So uh, you can generate a Docker image and push it to a Docker repository as well. And also uh, you can generate Kubernetes artifacts and, uh, and deploy uh, your uh, uh, deployment on top of Kubernetes using the EI uh, Kubernetes operator as well. Okay, so uh, it's a typical uh, thing to automate this development. Right? So we call it a continuous integration and continuous de development pipeline. Um, so any CICD pipeline begins with the development, we will be using integration studio for this stage. And after the development phase, we will be uh, committing all these artifacts, the projects to a common location. Uh, allowing different teams to, and different people to collaborate. Uh, GitHub is the popular choice for this nowadays. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we build the uh, pipeline for uh, CICD. So uh, Jenkins uh, and GitHub, also Maven and the shell commands are like the basic tools that is been uh, that we typically use to develop a CI/CD pipeline. 
and let me go to uh, briefly go to a typical uh, development pipeline we can build. Um, so uh, if you uh, take um, so first uh, we build our integration project using the studio and we can we can commit it to github and uh, we can build uh, uh, we call it a jenkins build, build pipeline um, which can be triggered by a git group that means whenever you uh, do a commit to uh, or update your basically your integration project, this uh, pipeline will get triggered. So uh, first phase of that pipeline is build. So we basically it will uh, pull uh, the integration uh, project and trigger a Maven build. And then uh, you can test it using the integration unit test framework. Uh, using uh, test Maven goals and all. And uh, if this is successful, right, and then uh, you can uh, deploy your C app uh, to the VM environment. Basically, uh, you can use a shell command uh, uh, in the Jenkins build job uh, to copy the uh, developed uh, C app uh, by the previous uh, steps onto the VM environment. Basically, if you are uh, setting up a cluster, uh, there will be multiple MI nodes with the shared uh, location for deployment folder will be shared. And uh, when you deploy onto the shared deployment folder, every uh, node will get uh, a copy and deploy. Right? So uh, everybody will be in sync in that manner, uh, every node, every uh, MI node. So that is how you can uh, build a uh, CI/CD pipeline for VI deploy, uh, VM deployment. Uh, so whenever, uh, so uh, you will realize when you, whenever you do a change uh, to the integration project, uh, it will be automatically built, then tested, and then get automatically deployed onto the uh, VMs. So there is no intervention needed. So uh, there is some documentation around that as well. You can uh, go and refer. So uh, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, post them on the questions tab uh, on the go to uh, webinar panel uh, so that we, we, will, we will try to answer them at the end of the webinar. Okay, so uh, so uh, when it comes to Kubernetes deployment, uh, the, the there's a few changes. Build and test uh, cases are same uh, for the uh, when you deploy on top of Kubernetes, you need an additional project. We call it a Kubernetes exporter project. You build it uh, and uh, you push it to GitHub also. And uh, uh, after a build and test being executed, uh, you will build the Docker image, and then uh, you will push that Docker image uh, to the Docker Hub or, uh, or some private Docker repository within the organization. And uh, then you will uh, pull the Kubernetes exporter project and build it. Uh, it will generate the artifacts uh, required uh, to deploy it on top of Kubernetes. And uh, you should have uh, set up a Kubernetes cluster uh, somewhere. And uh, you should install uh, WSO2 EI Kubernetes uh, operator into that uh, Kubernetes cluster. And uh, using Jenkins plugins like uh, Kubernetes deploy plugin uh, as a post post uh, job for the Docker build. If it is successful, you can deploy uh, it on top of the Kubernetes. Basically, to uh, send the uh, deploy the integration CR file. Uh, 
the operator understands the integration time then uh, do all the deployment uh, looking at the information number of the replicas uh, hpa details ingress details and uh, service details etc okay so, uh, so uh, now uh, we have looked at uh, how to develop integration artifacts and then how to deploy them and uh, it's important to know like how you can manage your servers like right? uh, to see uh, how, what are the artifacts deployed on each and every vm uh, etc so uh, i will call upon my colleague uh, describe uh, what are the server management feasibilities we are doing in uh, WSO2MI given version. In uh, latest WSO2 micro integrator, uh, we have offered a command line interface and an integrator dashboard to manage the server. Uh, just by opening the integrated dashboard, you will be able to see the improvements that we have done. One of the improvements is that the ability to download log files. In the previous version, the say the developers had to contact their DevOps admin or the relevant person to get the logs. So that is very time consuming and uh, cumbersome for the people developers to get the logs now they can just log into the integrated dashboard and download the logs another improvement is uh, managing the logging so in development environment or even in production environment if you want to troubleshoot any issue we may need to enable debug logs so maybe we need to change the log level of an existing logger or we may need to add a new logger for a separate class. So earlier we had to add it in the log4j2 properties file and then restart the server. So now what we can do is we can simply log into the integrated dashboard and change the existing loggers log level to get further debug logs. Or you can even add new loggers to further debug an issue. And in the UI, you will be able to see the particular loggers and the components and their log level as well. Uh, as we talked in uh, previous slides, the user management functionality is there in the integrated dashboard with the UI, where an admin user can view, add, or even delete the users. As I uh, told earlier, this is basic because the uh, user can't manage roles. So just by going through the integrated dashboard, we can do the user management after configuring an external user store, whether it be a LDAP or RDBMS user store. So the other tool that we have shipped uh, with micro integrator is the command line interface, which is also used for server management. If you take a look at the integrated dashboard in the command line interface, the command line interface is particularly useful when we want to automate a particular task that we want to achieve in integrated dashboard. We can simply write shell scripts using the micro integrator CLS command and get it done. Uh, and also there are some features which are exclusive to the command line interface as well. One of such feature is the support to encrypt plain text passwords. We can encrypt uh, plain text into a password and also we can create Kubernetes secrets using the command line interface. In earlier versions, if you want to encrypt a set of plain text, we need to do it one by one. Using the CLA, we can provide a properties file with all the plain text passwords and get it done within a matter of seconds. And as we uh, see earlier, like we can download and do the user management and manage logging, we can do all of those in the micro integrator CLA as well. The another exclusive functionality to the command line interface is the ability to retrieve the transaction counts. The users can retrieve the transaction count from the command line interface so that they can have a rough idea on the number of transactions they are doing for a particular month. The transactions can be retrieved from the CLA as a report or even as a summary based on the time period 
so now we have uh, seen uh, what are the improvements we have done how we develop tools how we do the deployment how we manage the server another important aspect of the integration is the observability uh, wso2 offers two observability solutions for monitoring and managing your integration deployments in micro integrator in the uh, previous versions we had the classic observability solution uh, let's say if we have an observability stack such as elk we can use it. but now we have introduced a cloud native observability with all new uh, tools uh, as per this uh, uh, flow diagram we have made use of grafana prometheus jager to provide a rich ui with extra metrics and logs to visualize and observe the uh, server to manage this more efficiently so after configuring a dash uh, after configuring the observability just by logging into the dashboard we can get the following view in the following view we can see the number of nodes that we have in the deployment and the service count the service count means the artifacts we have in the nodes and then the list of the nodes and the list of the service and we can also get the request counts that we have sent to the server among the request count how many of the requests are failed and we can get uh, rich graphs out of that as well we have done this using prometheus and grafana so basically we have dashboards for cluster node proxy service api and inbound endpoints uh, to facilitate this we have exposed an internal api from micro integrator which exposes the metrics from the prometheus api we scrape data from it and display it on the uh, dashboard if we click on the dashboards node view then we will get the following dashboard here we can see how long the server has been up and for the request count that has been uh, achieved in the particular node and approximate error count and the uh, latency and how long the artifacts has been running and all sorts of details we can get for the for a particular node as well as if we go to the service as well we can get this individual details which a very good ui uh, if you take a look at the bottom half of the screen we can see the wso2 server logs we have uh, made use of node level logs proxy service logs api logs and inbound endpoint logs so that we can uh, show that in the grafana dashboard uh, this dashboard is achieved uh, using a loki based logging stack which consists of three components uh, here the fluent bit we use fluent bit as the agent which gathers the logs and send them to the loki and the loki acts as the main server which is responsible for storing the logs and processing the queries from grafana we can log in and uh, execute our queries to get the particular log and display them on the dashboard uh, and we have the feature to get the trace for the particular request as well so once we configure the enable the tracing the jager client will publish data periodically so that we can see the trace and spans in the jager ui after enabling the tracing capabilities what we can see is how a message flows through a synapse artifact basically we can see what is the time we have spent on a particular artifact for a particular mediator or a particular sequence as spans so we can have a rough idea on the time that we spent on a particular mediation artifact where we spent more time where we spent spend less number of time why it takes so much time and configure our mediation effectively to make it execute faster using the uh, jager tracing client uh, on top of all this runtime uh, tooling and observability imp implementation we have also improved our connector experience uh, hasita will be taking you through what are the improvements we have done as as to the our connector experience what do you ask yeah um, so uh, connectors are basically the extensions for the 
uh, uh, WSO2 in my runtime. Basically, uh, when you want to integrate WSO2 MI with an, any external system, basically, uh, is is uh, uh, writing a connector or using an existing connector is the solution. So, uh, so we uh, we have uh, revamped some of the connectors uh, that were there in the connector store. Uh, we have picked and choose uh, most uh, popular connectors or the most uh, used connectors from our connector store and uh, made the uh, connector uh, experience better. Uh, and also we have uh, introduced some uh, internal changes to the uh, connector integration framework so that uh, you will get benefited from that as well. So, uh, um, so you will uh, get some details from this documentation link. And uh, there are some uh, connectors, the file connector, we have revamped the connector. You, you can uh, stream files, uh, you can read uh, from files, write to files, move files, and uh, do all kind of uh, File operations locally and using SFTP, FTPS, uh, those protocols using file connector. And Salesforce connector, we have introduced new authentication mechanism based on auth2, uh, extra for the Salesforce connector. Email connector is a newly written one. Uh, you can uh, um, send and receive emails using POC3 and IMAP. And, uh, Amazon S3 connector, uh, we have uh, redesigned it using the Amazon SDK. Uh, so you guys will get uh, all the benefits uh, uh, that Amazon guys have included in this SDK. And one of the major things was uh, adding the connection pool, uh, pooling capability for the connector so that uh, uh, whenever you initialize a connector, it will create a connection pool and uh, when you use an operation from that uh, connector it will pick a connection and uh, use it right so uh, so we will uh, not create uh, connections per message so we will basically reuse the connection so this obviously include the performance and the scalability uh, so we have added new uh, cache connection mechanisms and pooling mechanisms to our uh, connector framework. And uh, we have added the new con connection concept. If you have used uh, connectors uh, before from our connector store, you will have this experience. Uh, basically, if you want to uh, use some operations from a connector, before the connector operation, you will have to use some operation called init, right? To initialize the connection that is uh, used by the particular operation. For in this example, uh, you will uh, you uh, need to use init operation before the list event operation. Um, it will uh, the init will uh, generate uh, the required connection. For the list event, for like this, for each and every, before each and every operation, you will have to use this uh, init operation and this clutter the uh, design view and also view uh, added an unwanted burden to the users because they want to uh, pass these initialization parameters before each and every operation they use. So with with the new connection concept. Uh, uh, when you use an oper operation, you can uh, click the plus sign there and create a new connection. Um, for an example, I have created a file connection here. Uh, you can give an, some name for the connection and uh, pass all the parameters that is needed. Uh, so we have um, added, uh, enriched this UI basically. Uh, now uh, the mandatory parameters are clearly uh, depicted and also uh, you can do you can have uh, hints about the inputs as well when you click on uh, the, this particular um, 
input description and uh, also you have combo box service uh, they are necessary uh, so you don't need to wonder what kind of input uh, that should come there etc so once you define the connection right when uh, you can use it uh, in uh, any operation so you can define multiple connections as well and use them across the uh, different operations so you don't need to define uh, the connection parameters again and again you just need to reuse the name right uh, when when you use the operation you need just you just need to pick the connection you want to use so this goes uh, in line with the connection pooling concept very much because uh, when an operation in, is enough it will pick a connection from the pool and uh, use that connection to for the invocation and once it is done the connection will be will get written to the pool so uh, yeah so other things are like pretty much straightforward So uh, another thing is uh, we wanted to externalize the connection properties because uh, uh, when you think about the typical deployment, uh, uh, the servers you use for dev will not be the same uh, uh, for the UAT and obviously will not be the same for the production. So when you move the integration logic from across this environment, you need to move the same uh, logic, right? So for uh, for that, you need to externally provide these credentials and host names and all uh, to the for the connectors. Um, so uh, we have introduced the ways to provide uh, the uh, inputs for the connectors dynamically. Uh, there's a couple of ways to ex externalize these properties. One is using environment variables. Uh, this is typically useful. Uh, when uh, MI is deployed in the containerized environment. Uh, and you can define registry properties uh, with your host names and uh, credentials and all, and uh, refer them by keys in your integration logic. And also these variables can be passed using system, Java system variables. And even you can use a dot .properties file within the server itself uh, to feed these properties. Right? So, uh, you don't need to change your logic uh, uh, when you are moving from dev to uh, uh, UAT to production. And uh, when, when it comes to property panel, we have revamped it. We have added validations. You can see there is such uh, if, if all is good, uh, uh, this blue, uh, sorry, green tick will appear. And uh, also, uh, you can click on this EX button and uh, define your uh, expression as the input. Some it can be some property, etc. Uh, dynamic value that you can extract from the context, and uh, you can you will get uh, the tips like this. Uh, so you don't have to wonder to go looking into the documentation what this means, etc. So. Uh, so this is made uh, easy for the uh, development. Uh, yes, so uh, there is an API for everything now. So it is not feasible for us uh, to uh, trade connectors for everything in the world. So uh, sometimes when you need to integrate uh, uh, when you build uh, your integration scenario, uh, uh, it's good. Uh, uh, if it is popular connector, yes, definitely it will be there in our connector store. But if it is some specialized thing or uh, not a very common thing, uh, sometimes you will have to uh, write your own connector. So it's not very rare. It won't be uh, very rare because APIs are everywhere. So uh, we have added a complete documentation guide uh, for you uh, uh, with a video also uh, that guides you how to create a new connector. So also 
uh, the contributions are welcome for our connected store as well. So uh, you can share it uh, with, with the community. So, uh, so there are some additional resources. Uh, uh, we will share this slide uh, and the webinar with you through the site also. So you can refer them uh, 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 offline. And uh, we have a Slack channel, wso2ei.slack.com. You can post up the questions uh, or anything re related to micro-integrator uh, and we will answer to the uh, Slack channel as well. Okay, so it's uh, question time. Uh, so there is some questions already uh, <coughs> uh, placed. Uh, in the questions panel, uh, let me uh, go through uh, them uh, and answer uh, as time permits. Uh, okay, <clears throat> the first question is uh, the main user store uh, could be external. Uh, so basically, WSO2 uh, MI. Uh, WSO2 MI basically uh, comes with the uh, file based database, right? Uh, so, uh, out of the box, users will be stored there. But if you are setting up a cluster, definitely users should be shared across the nodes in that case, etc. You will have to uh, move to a LDAP user store or an RDBMS user store. And there is a question on how to configure multi threading for VM hosted REST based services. Uh, basically, uh, um, REST services are like uh, they, are, uh, they are using basically HTTP and HTTPS transports. Uh, we use uh, uh, an implementation called pass through transport for that. Basically, if you are not building the messages, it will just pass through for uh, in the binary manner for for speed, uh, speedy thing. And uh, you can configure the pass through transport using the uh, pass through the properties file uh, in uh, in MI. It's a configuration file. Uh, now uh, all these configurations. Uh, are baked into a single configuration file for uh, uh, we call it uh, deployment.toml file. So, uh, so basically, if you uh, want to change some configuration from the default value, you need to specify uh, your configuration there. So, documentation has all the details. Um, yeah, you can refer to that. Uh, so, it is not mandatory to use WSO to get operated to deploy in an application. Uh, I can write a Kubernetes artifact from application story and uh, use every other mechanism to do that. Yes, obviously, yes. Uh, you can uh, uh, use the integration studio to make the Docker image and uh, do whatever you need uh, with it using. The general tools for Kubernetes. Uh, there is no restriction. Even uh, you can make your own image using the Docker file. Uh, so, so actually, uh, what we have done is we have uh, made it easy for you uh, using uh, Kubernetes exporter projects and uh, Docker exporter projects. That's all we have done. We have. Uh, use the common tools as well. So if you wish to do it, do it on your own. You are welcome. Um, okay. <clears throat> Is it possible to integrate uh, logs into Google's track driver? Uh, I have to check on that question. Uh, so I will, uh, so we will uh, send uh, an email uh, uh, with the answer uh, basically uh, for now, uh, we we have JSON data tracing. Uh, 
actually i need to check uh, if you have the uh, possibility to integrate with uh, google's track driver okay so uh, i am using uh, studio version 710 i checked for update it been detect 720 i was hoping it would update rather than reinstall uh, basically the idea is uh, uh, the updates will be limited for a certain uh, certain uh, uh, version uh, when we release a merger version this is a major version change right because we we have uh, updated the eclipse platform itself so it cannot be shipped uh, obviously to a uh, uh, to an update so it's uh, it's uh, purely a different version so you will continue to get update along with 720 also um, uh, yeah so it's obviously a separate download is it possible to manage ad administration of uh, two instance of the same in my application for failover and full exit uh, with the deployment in vm um manage administration uh, basically uh, we don't uh, share status between uh, in my instances so uh, if the uh, if they are shared also now we have rdbms coordination uh, so we can uh, uh, we can uh, deploy a active active cluster and uh, um, and uh, and use that deployment. So for the in the administration perspective, uh, you will uh, have to use the CLI log lo to the separate two VMs individually and uh, manage the artifacts. So uh, typically uh, we uh, share the artifacts uh, all throughout the uh, cluster. So it will be same basically. So, uh, so there's a lot more questions. Uh, so, uh, so basically, uh, we will answer them uh, through emails. Uh, don't worry. Uh, and uh, uh, we would like to uh, encourage you or invite you to participate in our uh, in our survey it's a small survey with a few questions so that we can get some feedback from you guys for our improvements um, and uh, uh, yeah i would like to uh, thanks for all the participants uh, thanks thanks guys